I'm going to call to order the April 5th, 2010 work session for the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, although we normally go in order and we would like to do that out of the um, respect of the uh, Nursing Home and Adult Home Community Advisory Committee's annual report, I would ask that we take that out, take that first, and that is page 145, item I-1. That's 145, item I-1. One and I will call on Mrs. Abinader without any objection. I'll call on Mrs. Abinader to present to us um, the report. Thank you very much. We're allowed to speak to come tonight, this afternoon. I'm doing these in the evening to um, allow us to come and present our report to you. And this is our 2009 annual report, just to give you an idea of where the adult care home. Community Advisory Committee and the Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee are um, for this past year. And um, I will not read the entire report to you because you all have received that already, but I did want to share with you, um, just hit the highlights maybe, and let you know where both of the committees stand. The um, Adult Care Home Community Advisory Committee, as we have shared with you all, for several years in a row, um, continues to need more members appointed. And this is an ongoing issue for many different committees, and we understand that certainly. But we um, do ask that you all continue with um, getting the word out there as much as possible that we do need more members on the committee. Mrs. Abinader, can you explain what the committee members do at this point in time? Certainly, I'd be glad to. I'm so sorry. The community advisory committees are appointed by the county commissioners and they work with the regional ombudsman program. The ombudsman program is a federal program mandated to support the residents bill of rights. The residents bill of rights protects individuals who live in nursing homes and assisted living facilities throughout the county. And in Cabarrus County, because of the size of the county, um, we have a, a committee that is designated to nursing homes only and another committee that is designated to assisted livings only. And they meet, um, they are required to have 15 hours of initial training, 10 hours of ongoing annual training, and they receive their training through the ombudsman program. And that is how I'm involved with the group. And then they are certainly, um, responsible to the county commission in each of the counties that we work in. Do they go out to nursing homes? Do they just do something out online? What is it that the, the committee members do? They are required to visit each of the facilities in the county on a quarterly basis. And once they do that, they complete a quarterly, it's a standardized state form that we use, and they complete that form. And that is public record for anyone who is interested in learning more about facilities. So if someone is looking at moving into a nursing home or an assisted living, they can contact my office, and I'll be glad to share with them those reports to let them know how those facilities perform on a regular basis. We also share those reports with the Department of Social Services so that if there are problems, the Departments of Social Services um, can follow up on the assisted livings if there are any issues. How much time per month does someone typically work or, or assist on this committee? Typically, we, we estimate six to eight hours a month. A month. Yes. Okay. So this is not your average volunteer position. Um, it, it takes, uh, it's, a, it's a labor intensive as well as um, a challenging role because when these committee members visit they see things that are hard they see things that are somewhat upsetting at times and there are feelings at some for for some of the facilities that tend to have troubled um, performance there is a feeling of not being able to get anywhere with some of those facilities okay thank you mm -hmm. um, you had some other points that you wanted to raise absolutely the um, I will say um, with the adult care home not having as many members as they need they have not been able to visit all of the homes as required the nursing home committee however um, I will touch on the fact that they have had 100% turnover since last since about this time last year but they are doing wonderfully right now they have um, despite all of the turnover and all the new members that they have they are good to go they are doing very well and being able to um, meet all of their mandates. So we're pleased about that. 
Um, there's a bit about the major trends affecting long-term care. These are affecting both um, nursing home and assisted living, not only here in Cabarrus, but also statewide and across the nation. Um, and those are just some points about long-term care in general and some of those issues, include, including um, the mental health population being introduced into assisted livings, which is a difficult mix to be able to manage for anyone, um, as well as the um, issues with dental care not being able to be provided as it should be. Um, so we've mentioned some of those things in our report as well. Our committee goals for 2010 um, to continue to advocate for quality care and quality of life for all of the residents in Cabarrus County. Um, the second committee goal that we have to continue to recruit members when a new member is appointed, there is an element of getting those folks acclimated to the role. They, um, the committee members do a great job of helping their fellow new members be able to um, learn where the facilities are, learn who the point person is in each of the facilities. And for 20 some odd facilities that they visit, um, that's a lot to learn. And so the first year is really a year of orientation and getting to know the role and getting to know um, the logistics. And then as they move into um, further appointments after that, they're able to um, really get going with, um, with, their, with their mandates. The, um, Nursing Home Committee has a plan to not only visit the homes at the minimum requirement of once per quarter, but also to kind of go above and beyond that to start doing some friendly visiting as well. And that's, um, that's a terrific goal for this new group of folks to have. And um, let's see what else. For the, as far as what the committees are asking for from the County Commission, um, the, the main issue that they are requesting, um, again, is just continuing to help us recruit new members as much as possible. And then the other would be when someone does show interest to route them toward the Adult Care Home Committee right now until we get more folks on the Adult Care Home Committee uh, as much as possible. Now, if someone has a conflict of interest and they're not able to serve on the Nursing Home the Adult Care Home Committee, certainly we'd love to have the volunteer rather than not have them, but when at all possible, we would really love to see um, more folks be steered toward the Adult Care Home group um, as much as possible. And um, lastly, simply to say thank you for your support of this committee. Um, the county commissioners, especially Kay, who keeps us straight with the appointments, folks <laughs> rotating on and off. And um, we also received support from the Departments of Social Services and the um, County Department of Se the Senior Center the de through the Department of Aging. And um, last, I'll simply just go through and let you all know we did have a, a, a good group of folks come. If I could just show you who those folks are. And um, first we have Liz Ryan, who's sitting over here on this side. And Liz, um, on your list here, it shows that Liz is pending orientation, and I'm happy to say Liz completed her orientation class already um, since the time that this um, report was sent in. Liz has completed her orientation. And then we also have Jerry Shin behind me, and Ed Burns, and Karen Gabbard, and I don't think anyone else has come in. But I that I know of, but these folks are very dedicated to what they do and how they help in the county, and um, I appreciate them very much. They help make my job easier and help alert me to issues that are going on in the, in the facilities that I work in, and um, they do a, a great job for the county. So we appreciate you all taking the time to listen to our report today. Are there any other questions? Uh, have you ever had the uh, people who have volunteered do a survey or have an opportunity after they've served to uh, suggest ways in which you could make the, um, the time commitment or whatever it is, there's something that key is keeping people from continuing year after year. Don't know what it is. You need a survey to find out what that is. And it, has that ever been done, because, uh, maybe the, the amount of time or some of the issues you've mentioned are the, are the stopping gap, but um, do you know why people are dropping off so quickly? 
In many cases, I, I, to answer your question directly, I have never done a, an actual study or survey to find out um, why we have the turnover. I will say that of the folks who have rotated off from the Cabarrus committees mo most recently, um, Ruth Wynn, Barbara Blackmore, who just left about a year ago, um, in their cases, they had both served um, actually quite a few terms in a row. So they'd been on for quite a long time. And um, other folks find after one year, that beginning orientation year, they find that it's just not the job for them and it's not something that they enjoy. The time commitment, I think, is tough. I know that many of the folks that do serve, um, many of them are, are employed and working and balancing work, life, and this type of, um, of time-intensive volunteer work, I think, can be a challenge. And other folks have had to leave the committee due to their own health concerns or due to caregiving for a, a loved one. Um, so those are the ones that come to mind most, um, most quickly for me that they've left, but um, I do like your idea of, um, of finding out more, a little bit more um, objectively, why folks don't remain on the committee. Any other questions? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And from what I understand, with the report given us today, we do not need to place it on our April the 19th meeting for another report. Is that correct? This That's satisfies? Absolutely. Okay. Thank absolutely. you, Mrs. Abinader. We thank you very much. With the, uh, besides going out of order in that reward, we have the uh, agenda before us. Uh, certainly the recognitions will be taken care of on April the 19th, as well as the um, consent agenda as it relates to the new business under G, or actually uh, with the agenda that we have before us, absent I-1, is there a motion to approve the agenda as is? So moved, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion, we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries, and do we have a motion to uh, put everything as is, except for the new business that we're going to discuss today on our agenda for April the 19th? So we got a motion, second we motion. have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. Motions carries. Now going to new business under G1, which is found on page 49. And Mr. Day. Thank you. Uh, a couple of years ago when the board uh, adopted its sustainable community <coughs> initiative, one part of that was the creation of a food policy council. And that was uh, one of the items that was also included in the successful um, grant application uh, that the county made to the North Carolina Agricultural Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund. There's probably about 50 food policy councils in the country. The General Assembly established one for the state um, last session, um, and I am one of the people that serves on that committee. Uh, it's envisioned that each county would have such a policy or such a policy council. There is one in Mecklenburg County that recently formed. Um, these groups identify and strengthen connections between food, health, natural resource protection, economic development, and the agricultural community. There's some supporting information here, uh, but uh, essentially this group would be charged with performing research educating the community, developing strategies, and making policy recommendations that will encourage the development of a robust, sustainable local food economy and a healthier population. And this group will also then oversee uh, the community food assessment, which uh, was one of the items that we were awarded um, in the grant I just mentioned earlier. Um, and that will be performed by the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. This group will oversee that, uh, and that really, that study will be sort of a, a look at what the supply and demand uh, is for food, where there are uh, deficits in nutrition and the public health problems that they cause and how those can be met um, and uh, mitigated locally. Um, so we think this is a, a pretty important thing and it's one that is uh, sort of an emerging trend across the country and we're uh, hopeful that we can be on the front end of that trend. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, I have one on the membership. I noticed that, that a recommendation to uh, will come to us in May as to who will be on that original committee. Um, and there's quite a broad spectrum of um, areas and individuals 
uh, occupations, et cetera, that you want to have represented, represented, but I do also notice that it ends with concerned citizens. How will concerned citizens not be able to let you know that they might be willing to serve on this committee? We're going to turn this over to the fine folks in our communications department for them to broadcast as widely and uh, as among as many different medias as they can so we can get the word out and we'll make an effort uh, through existing organizations for them to try and broadcast to their members but we'll also take advantage of channel 22 of media releases and uh, anything else that we can do to make everybody aware. Any other questions? We have we will be adopting a resolution, so we need to place this under new business unless it, um, it could be on consent. Uh, it doesn't have to be under new business, and uh, unless unless okay. you want it to be, and then of course the appointments would come to the board then in May. Why don't we put it under new business? That way we can talk about it some more, and people can get a better feel about what's going on, and mm -hmm. hopefully we'll get one step ahead of our communications department on concerned citizens. <laughs> yeah, I'd make a motion to place on new, new business. We have a motion. We have a second. second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Uh, I would be remiss also to update everybody that Commissioner Carruth has business outside of the county and said that if, if needed be, he would be available by phone um, if he needed to be here, but he will uh, otherwise he is out of county on business. Next matter we have is G2, is the EDC uh, grant request for Cellguard LLC, a poly poor, and, uh, and also a request for public hearing. At this time, I call on Mr. McDaniels and Mr. Cox to present this information to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Uh, Cellguard is uh, no stranger to any of us in Cabarrus County having had the opportunity to uh, certainly read about the President's visit last week and uh, hear the Governor's remarks that she made here in Cabarrus County on January the 20th. Their proposal is to purchase land in the Industrial Park, International Business Park at exit 55 and to construct a 200,000 square foot manufacturing facility employing about 209 people. Um, is an innovative energy sustainable uh, industry and uh, I think that you have received the packets on it perhaps you've had the chance to take a look at them it calls for an industrial grant uh, from the city of Concord and from Cabarrus County and I believe the grants that we're looking at uh, on the city's part and on the county's part are virtually the same with the one exception being that uh, because the county's tax rate is slightly higher to, that that would be the only difference so unless you have any questions that would pretty much cover the base I looked at the uh, uh, proposed agreement and it's and mr. cook correct me if I'm wrong but for the most part as it relates to um, protection provisions as it relates to uh, any monies that we're paying up front or that the payment of taxes um, there are some uh, language. There's some language in the agreement that uh, protects us, as well as it mirrors the city's uh, request of our um, agreement as uh, agreement as well. Uh, that's correct. I think you're referring to the clawback provisions. There are unsecured clawback provisions, but there are nevertheless clawback provisions in the proposed agreement that would require. If the company goes out of business within a certain period of time or, or doesn't meet certain of its um, projections, that um, the uh, money that's either been advanced to the, um, to the company uh, as the uh, um, payment for land acquisition costs would be returned to the county. And uh, that the, uh, the second part of the grants, namely the, uh, the uh, grant awards of of taxes that have been paid by the company pursuant to their uh, to the agreement that provides that, that the investment they've made that they've made in the county um, that if that's been made and the taxes have been paid upon it and then there's they don't meet those projections that are contained in the document then a certain portion of those would be re would be returned 
uh, to the county, depending on how many years they've actually been in business. We can go through it specifically, but there's uh, there's some pretty, uh, it depends on how long they've actually uh, been here and been in business after they get the uh, facility built. The one thing that I did not see in the agreement that the board asked uh, at our last meeting to uh, have in the agreement that uh, I don't think is going to be an issue is um, matching the performance with the state. Uh, the board talked about that the performance requirements by the state as best can be mirrored in our agreement and I did not see that in our agreement but I asked um, Mr. Cook to uh, work on that and I don't think that is an issue from what I understand. It's not going to be different than what the state's being requested. I thought that's what the board asked to be um, to pursue and I don't think that's any different than, than um, it's not going to be any different than what the state is asking I should say. So. Uh, that's correct. Actually I think that was something that was proposed by the EDC right initially as a as a uh, way of dealing with the clawback right. provisions okay so. any other questions or any questions for me in other words they're planning for the Cabarrus plant to employ what 209 people it says 223 223 yes sir wonder if they don't employ but a hundred if my understanding of the of the document that you've created there's not an employment a number in there not a specific number of jobs uh, the draft agreement from the county does not contain that uh, the in the county's draft document the the total language on the clawbacks has been left somewhat open until we saw what the what the city ended up with mm -hmm. but the one thing that's uh, that's missing from the city document that we do plan to put in the county document is tying it to the um, uh, the conditions that would be imposed upon the company by uh, by the federal government and the state of North Carolina and those deal with the, the jobs issue and that's so that's satisfactory to us I believe it would be to the company as well and I think that was a recommendation from the EDC uh, Commissioner Privet is that the uh, that the jobs be tied the performance or the hiring of jobs be tied to the, the, the grants as well yeah the reason why I raise that question is there's a recent article uh, the Winston-Salem paper uh, <clears throat> they did a research on in the Winston-Salem area with Winston-Salem Greensboro on the announcement of jobs the promise of jobs they only found out that these companies had provided 70 percent of the jobs they had promised okay. so they told uh, they're going to do X number of jobs but uh, according to this article it was in the Winston paper only they only provided 70 percent of the jobs that were promised. Mr. Chairman, I think our suggestion was that if in the event the company defaulted on any of the grants, inducements, or incentives that the state offered, then it would therefore become in default of the grant provided by Cabarrus County. So insofar as there are job targets in the state grant, and were you to adopt that language in this final draft, then they would be tied together based on what they've committed to the state. Well, I was looking through this, and I don't see that anywhere in the material given to us. Well, I think the chairman mentioned that he did not see it and that Mr. Cook plans to place it in there. Any other questions? Make a motion. Put on the new business. public hearing and new business. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next matter we have is... Uh, G3, which is found on page 103, 103. it's uh, section 55316, Job Access and Reverse Commute Program Grant, JARC and Public Hearing. I call on Mr. Bob Bushy to present this information to us. Actually, I'm going to let Steve Coot present the information. <laughs> He's been working on this JARC grant for a couple of years. So. Uh, what we're doing is requesting a uh, public hearing for the renewal of the JARC grant. We've uh, submitted a grant renewal for the service that started back in October. Um, mm -hmm. The grant would uh, require matching funds. This year, the county matched those funds. And next year's proposal, we're, we're asking for matching funds from the, the communities involved and not the county. 
Uh, if they match the funds and we get the grant, it will continue. If not, it will go away. If they provide part of the funds, then we'll provide the service at a reduced rate. Uh, just, just as a little background, we, we started this uh, service back in October and the first month, uh, we carried 22 people the whole month. And this month is the highest month we had. We had 165 folks ride this month. And that's uh, just over the last three or four weeks, those figures daily have been rising. And it was, uh, if you remember back when the city buses started carrying folks and you'd see them ride around with one or two people in there and you wondered what are they doing but now you see that that's that happens you know there there are a lot more riders on there and we're hoping that that's going to happen here and uh we've got uh i've even talked with some uh large employees great wolf lodge uh, purdue farms about carrying clusters of their folks uh to and from work and that's what the the grant is actually based on is uh, job access and reverse commute for the JARC. Can you explain what actually JARC is and what the routes are? Um, I, I mean, I know what it is, but I want to. Uh, JARC is an anagram for uh, job access and revert, reverse commute. Uh, we have two routes uh, that leave from Midland uh, at 6 30 in the morning. One goes through leaves from Midland and goes through Mount Pleasant uh, up to the CK Rider uh, hub in Concord. We have added a new stop at the AME Zion Church in Mount Pleasant and uh, taken another stop away. It was at the food line. We weren't getting any riders from there. We've already picked up some riders from the church. The other one leaves from Midland and goes through Harrisburg, stops at the Aldi's at Town Center there, and goes on out to Concord Mills. And uh, those are the main routes. We do have uh, one driver that, as he comes to work, does two straight routes right up 601 to the CK Rider Hub, then takes over for one of the other drivers as they leave. Um, so in essence, we're, we've got the county sort of surrounded on the outside by those first two, and then one uh, going straight up 601 to CK, to CK Rider Hub. And, uh, we, you know, we make exceptions if we can uh, make a route deviation and still keep to our uh, routes. We've done that and it has uh, occurred in that manner and we have picked up ridership doing that. So we're doing whatever we can do to increase the ridership and uh, the drivers have embraced that and are doing a good job at, at doing that. Commissioner Meyer. Uh, help me understand if you have um, a, a bus that goes from wherever Mount Pleasant, wherever to Concord Mills. It doesn't stop anywhere in between. Is that correct? It just goes to Concord Mills. It goes from Midland to Harrisburg to Concord Mills. And it has one stop in Harrisburg. Yes, ma'am. All right. So how does that benefit? How do people get to work that way? I don't quite understand. I mean, unless they work at Concord Mills. Well, there's, there's any number of, first of all, Concord Mills and the Carolina Mall, uh, you know, are identified as two of the employment centers uh, in the county, two of the largest. And that's why they were set up in that manner. Now, if somebody wants to go from, we do carry somebody from Midland to uh, the, the town hall in Mount Pleasant most every day, one of the ladies that works there. Uh, if there are places along the way to where people can get to work, we make those adjustments and have done that. We're fixing to add a stop out at a mobile home park out off Rocky River Road, lower Rocky River Road, where uh, they have a lot of folks out there that, that aren't, uh, that are without transportation. And part of, this, part of this too is not just people back and forth to work. Uh, we take, uh, if somebody's down at the bus stop, we take them, uh, we go from uh, Midland to Mount Pleasant to the CK Rider to the, uh, Northeast Medical Center mall area before we go back to Midland. So if they're at the bus stop and are going to the mall area of Concord Mills, they get on to and ride just like anyone else. Probably most of our riders are not, right now aren't 
uh, the employed. Uh, there are people that are taking advantage of that because we're at those situations. But I did mention we've I've talked with a couple of the larger employees and we're, uh, employers in the county, and uh, just a couple of weeks ago at Great Wolf Lodge, and they're preparing a, a list of clusters of their employees that we might be able to get to to and from work. I, I would be very supportive of, of helping people get to their job. I'm not so sure I'm supportive of providing bus transportation for people to go to specific business areas. That's sort of um, picking and choosing who you're going to well, encourage we, in, 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 in being We do also have an agreement with CK Rider for bus transfers so that somebody can take our service to the bus service to get to anywhere the bus will go. Uh, I understand what you're saying. The issue with the, the federal grants is that we can't choose who gets on the bus. We have to set it up designed for work, but anybody that's at that bus stop, we are required to. What allow. is the charge for the riders? One dollar. One dollar. And the CK rider folks uh, allow us to transfer folks to them uh, and accept our transfers so they don't have to pay again. If they come back by the CK rider and transfer back to us, they have paid them a dollar and they'll give us a transfer. So the most they have to pay going to and from is $2. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now, if, um, sorry, if there was another company other than the ones that you mentioned, but if somebody hears this broadcast and um, they decide that they would be interested in, in participating in this and having their business be a stop, um, can they do that, one, and two, how would they contact you if that's the case? They can give uh, me a call at the office uh, at transportation, and our number's in the book, or it's 920-2925. Uh, anybody that asks if we had somebody that would make the the trips worthwhile sure they could be involved and there wouldn't be a have to whole lot have to be a whole lot of uh, employees going if we can get uh you know a few every day uh, it's amazing over the past few months how just a couple of people every day uh make this worthwhile i mean we've you know we started carrying the lady you asked about uh miss mine down about the folks not going to work a lady gets on the midland she comes up to the uh, senior center every day at the uh, at the Coulter Life Center I should say and her grandmother used to bring her up there every day and come get her at the end of the day and and go to work and so now she's leaving her at the bus stop as our when our bus driver gets there and we drop her at the Coulter Center on our way in through the place and take her back the same way uh I think the point I was trying to make is um, a small business owner in the county who's not on the stop of the buses loses the opportunity to get people to their business and the people at Carolina Mall or Concord Mills who are their competitors benefit from it but the tax money is coming from both of those areas. That's, that's the point I'm well, making. Uh, and yes, ma'am, I understand that, but to make the, the service viable, we have to serve as many people as we can. And uh, like Ms. Poole said, anybody that needs the help, we've, you know, we've done route deviations for individuals to take them to and from work. So it's not really, uh, the biggest part problem for us was getting the word of this out. And now it sounds real simple to say the more people ride, the more people ride. But that's in actuality what it does. The more people ride, the more people find out about it, and the more that come on and take the service. And uh, and that's sort of where we're at right now. But along with what Commissioner Mine is saying is, and what I think I hear you saying is that um, if there is a small business, you know, in close proximity to the route, you will service that small business as well. Absolutely. Okay. You don't do that to the exception of that small business, but. Right. Would, okay. And and if there was nobody riding to the other places, uh, they were uh, they It'd were be easier to make that exception. Right. And they and what was pointed out those were two of the largest okay. employment centers in the county, which is why with limited vehicles we had to 
you know, service that. And uh, sure, we make adjustments to that and do it every day. Any other questions? We have a motion to place this under new business. So move, Mr. Chairman. We got a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, folks. See you on the 19th. Mm -hmm. Next matter we have is on page 106 is G4, the approval of the proposed changes to Odell, Enochville, and Kannapolis. This time I call on Mr. Langer for the presentation. Good afternoon. I um, believe he's behind y'all. Sorry. <laughs> Today I brought uh, some rather large maps for you to look at that basically reflect um, the proposed changes to the Odell Kannapolis uh, rule in Enable Fire Districts. The first map is really an extra map. I wanted to be able to show you uh, the current Enable District overlaid over the changes. This will give you an idea showing how the district is being split. The area in pink is what will be moved to the Odell District. Anything in the blue will be moved to the Kannapolis Rule. You probably can't see it, but all the red dots in here are the hydrants uh, within the Enable District. Basically, everything here is pretty much hydrated. There's hydrants along here and here. Every one of those uh, residential homes we'll see a, an insurance premium reduction. They will go from a nine down to a six for homes. And then if there's any businesses within this area, they'll go to a four because that is what Kannapolis Fire Department has a rating of. Um, these other maps are the maps that have already been approved by the state. Um, this is the Kannapolis rule. And then this here would be the Odell district map. Um, at this point, we're asking that uh, the board hold a public hearing in May uh, due to uh, the published notice requirement of the 14-day notice, um, there's not 14 days between the work session and the public uh, or the regular meeting, so we're asking that a public hearing be held in May. That's pretty much it. Any questions? Okay. We'll come back before the board also in May at the work session. Uh, with some other information on after we, we meet with Rich on the wording because this also includes a uh, change to the ordinance. I think it's uh, Article uh, 3 in the Code of Ordinance that covers the fire district boundaries. So that will have to be updated. Move we place this in, on the agenda in May for a public hearing. Second a motion. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you. Motion carries. Next is G5, is an interlocal agreement between the cities of Concord and Kannapolis as it relates to the new 911 call center equipment. Mr. Downs. The uh, board previously approved the, uh, we had discussed a few months ago, the, the board approved the use of 911 funds uh, to purchase equipment and to place this equipment at the city of Concord and the city of Kannapolis's uh, 911 dispatch centers. Uh, in order to do that, you gave us permission to, to address the state 911 board to ask permission to use those funds in that manner because currently the, the regulations are that we're, the monies come directly to the primary center of the county and that you're supposed to use those funds only for that center. Uh, you've given us permission to go to the state and request to be able to use the funds for those centers as well so that we could buy like equipment and the systems would be uh, compliant with each other and also the two smaller systems or the smaller centers could actually use as backup centers should should the need arise uh, if the county system goes down uh, for any length of time. Uh, the request went to the state 911 board. They sent back that prior to them reviewing and making a decision, they wanted to have an interlocal agreement in place. Uh, so this is the uh, the agreement here before you tonight, uh, there would be one for the city of Concord and one for the city of Kannapolis. Uh, Mr. Cook drafted uh, this agreement and what it says is that the county will use, if approved, the county would use the 911 money to purchase equipment. The county would be, be responsible for purchasing the equipment, placing the equipment in those two centers and then maintaining it should, should there be a um, uh, a need to replace or, or repair the equipment. And the city agrees to accept the equipment, 
house it in a climate controlled environment and do the daily maintenance such as keeping it dust free and that type of stuff. Uh, and that's pretty much the gist. There would be no money changing hands. Uh, again, the county would purchase the equipment through that 911 fund. Uh, Rich, would you have anything to add to that? Well, the, the uh, Kannapolis uh, agreement is the one that's actually in, in the uh, in the agenda packet. The Concord one was to be identical. They've gotten hung up a little bit on this bailment language that's in that's in the document. And I'm not quite sure why. I'm, I'm expecting a call back from the city to see what the, the issue is with that. But we're trying to make the agreements identical. It is a basically it's the county's equipment. It's placed in their location. It's for the mutual benefit of the, of the city and the county. I didn't think there would be an issue with that kind of language. It is a bailment under the law in that circumstance. So, uh, but that, that legal language troubles them a little bit. So we'll try to get that worked out before the meeting. Any questions for Mr. Downs or Mr. Cook? These systems are supposed to somewhat act in redundancy that should our system go down, we can go to Concord or Kannapolis to stay live yes sir uh the, if if it was intended to to create a backup situation if we go down we would be able to move to their location with uh, and and use one uh one or or more consoles that they would make available to us uh so that we could dispatch answer and dispatch our calls from their location okay do we have any um any other questions we have a motion to place this under consent agenda all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you. Motion carries. G6 is the Adequate Public Facilities Mitigation Agreement for Wexford Point Apartment Project. Um, Mrs. Watts, are you, who is presenting? Or is Mr. Cook? Mr. Cook, how about? I'll uh, be happy to do it. How about helping us with this? Uh, yeah. This is um, on page 119. Susie Morris had left the file with me on this. This is a... Um, this is probably the second of these types of situations that we've had where under the adequate public facilities ordinance there the uh, board approved a reservation of capacity and that was done uh, um, last September and the the reservation of capacity uh, is in the, uh, the agenda package and essentially sets out the amount of voluntary mitigation payment that that the um, developer is going to pay and also sets out the um, the actual phasing schedule for the uh, for the project. In this case, it's uh, um, uh, 106 um, residential apartment units uh, off of Davidson Highway in, in Concord. So basically, um, the uh, developer wants to proceed with the project. You know, with the reservation capacity, they actually just got in line to reserve their their place, and now uh, that they've done that, they're ready to move forward and. Uh, would like to uh, enter into a, um, a consent agreement with the county on the same basis that's in the reservation of capacity. I think in the other situation, and Cassie, correct me if I'm wrong, when this other uh, circumstance occurred that's like this, uh, when it came up for approval of a consent agreement, the, uh, the board placed it on the consent agenda because it is the same terms and conditions and just follows our standard consent agreement form. Um, but of course, it's the board's pleasure as to how to treat it. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Cook or Mrs. Watts? We have a motion to place this under consent agenda. We got a second. I'll second it. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Next one is G7, which is the consent agreement with Hawthorne Subdivision Project. Who gets the? That's me again, Mr. Chairman. This is um, a situation involving the Hawthorne um, project, which is out off Robinson Church Road and Peach Orchard Road below Harrisburg. And the situation here is that there was a consent agreement that was actually entered into with this developer at the time, Meridian Development LLC, which provided for 104 lots on approximately 82 acres and um, it had a build-out schedule that extended over I think it was three years 
excuse me, four years, from 2008 to 2011. Um, nothing in that uh, project has been built. The bank that uh, financed the construction of, uh, of the uh, infrastructure for the project uh, foreclosed on the project and has actually, through a uh, wholly owned subsidiary, taken title to the property. Uh, they have hired um, uh, Bob Burkett from JMB Development, uh, who did Moss, the Moss Creek development. He is actually serving as a consultant <coughs> for uh, the bank in trying to get this project off the ground. And so the bank and its uh, subsidiary is going to actually be the uh, project developer. And what they've asked to do is to be able to, to essentially take an assignment of the existing consent agreement. Um, Ordinarily, our, the language in our consent agreements allows that if they show some financial uh, ability to go ahead and complete the project. However, in this case, since the consent agreement ran between the developer and, uh, and the county, we have no developer that can actually assign the consent agreement to the bank. So we essentially um, create a situation where we would need a new agreement between the county and the bank. Um, this situation um, was one in which the, you may recall that the developer came to the county at the time that the consent agreement was, was being talked about and offered to pay more than what our voluntary mitigation payment was for that project. Namely, it was $4,034 a lot, and the, uh, the developer came in and agreed to pay $6,000 per lot as the voluntary mitigation payment. The board approved that. The consent agreement was signed and recorded. The bank is apparently willing to, to um, pay that same amount uh, and uh, uh, to enter into a consent agreement with the county under those same circumstances. So um, what they'd like to do is essentially get an assignment of the existing consent agreement, but since, again, we, don't, we can't do an assignment because the developer is no longer around, uh, what they're proposing is that there be a new consent agreement on the old terms. So that's essentially what, what uh, has been proposed. There is, um, there is one other situation I can think of that was not exactly similar to this, but uh, where a consent agreement was um, essentially revived, if you will, um, and the, uh, the build-out schedule was changed or updated uh, because essentially under the existing consent agreement, the build-out schedule, I think the last year for it was uh, 2011. Um, uh, so that uh, there's been some discussion about having an adjustment of that. I tried to, to get in touch with uh, Mr. Burkett today before the meeting and, and couldn't reach him to discuss that issue with him. But um, I would suggest, um, since they're willing to, to uh, get on with this project now and, and the bank wants to uh, get it developed, that if, if you could consider putting it on your uh, new business for uh, for the meeting on the 19th, we can probably get that issue uh, worked out and uh, can uh, advise the board accordingly. Well, I'm, I'm in favor of going ahead and, and letting the bank be the developer in this case and transferring that. We have so many of these situations in the county and the land has pretty much already been damaged by all that infrastructure that's gone there and we also have jobs that we need and we need those construction jobs so i'm pleased to know that somebody's willing to to get in there and take some of these things and go with them i, I think it's a good idea i would echo, echo commissioner minus comments and i'd like to find out what the bid out schedule would is proposed and and what are we you know what sort of build out we are looking for i mean not we but what they are proposing so we can know that prior to our vote but any other comments? Got a motion to place this on the new business agenda. So moved. Second. We got a motion and we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Next matter is G8 is the county government office complex outfit of the seventh floor of the sheriff's admin building to accommodate the relocation of several county departments, Board of Elections, Parks Administration, EMS, and DSS legal. Mr. Downs. Uh, this is the the <laughs> this is the next step in our search for a location to uh, relocate and house some of our um, county departments that are either in leased space or, or in spaces that we own that would 
potentially be uh, available for us to sell. Uh, we have looked around, and as you know, we've, we've probably discussed somewhere in the neighborhood of 27 or 28 of these locations to build uh, or to buy and upfit uh, an existing building. And that, the, that was uh, an estimated cost somewhere between six and a half to eight and a half million dollars to do, to do that, uh, uh, that process. So uh, we, we had some other further discussions of, you know, how, how can we accommodate these departments, create some space and doing it in a, in a uh, less expensive way. And the board approved several years ago when we built the Sheriff's Administration building was to provide a shell, shell up on the top floor up there for future office space should the Sheriff's Department or some of the law enforcement agencies need to expand. Uh, so what we're proposing tonight to the board, there's 19,000 square feet available approximately 19,000 square feet. The map is attached to your, uh, and should be uh, the next page down from there, uh, one, yeah, right there. Uh, it's, an, it's an identical footprint to the floors below. Um, there is an elevator that already goes up there. The floors, the, uh, it has been rough plumb right there where the arrow is for, for uh, public restrooms or gang restrooms there. Uh, the air, uh, the, the main mechanical system is in place. However, there would have to be additional air handling uh, units on this floor to accommodate the, the new space. So what we're proposing to do uh, is create some flexible office space, space that could be moved around should these departments grow or vacate the building and the Sheriff's Department need to expand in the future. Uh, so there would be very few hard walls. Most would be soft walls. Um, and we, we feel that we, could, we would have the uh, the options to move the Board of Elections, Park Administration, EMS Administration, the DSS Legal Department, um, and potentially Guardian Ad Litem as well. And then and there may even be some square footage left over in the process that we can maybe create some space in the courthouse as well, move some of those agencies over or, or a portion of one of their agencies. Uh, can answer some questions from there. Again, it, it's, it would be intended to be flex space. Uh, we're looking somewhere and depending on who you talk to, that cost for flex space is somewhere between 50 to $75 per square foot. That's the estimate. So in order to do the space, we're looking somewhere between a million and a half and $2 million, or a million and $2 million, just depends on how it would come in. Uh, and what we're requesting uh, in the form of a, uh, with this petition here is, is, to, is for the board to direct staff, if you feel that this is a, a doable project, to direct staff to go ahead and engage uh, uh, YCH architects to go ahead and start looking at the space and doing some uh, from some space planning here and programming on this space so that we can bring it back to you for your uh, review and approval. Commissioner Mine. Uh, I'm just wondering about parking for people who need access to people coming in and out of Board of Elections to to um, you know what for whatever reason or, or how much public use will there be I know there'll be staff use, but how much public use and is there going to be adequate? The, the parking lot that was, is being constructed right now is approximately 157 spaces there. Uh, but also in, in, in our, in our five-year plan, we intend to remove the existing jail and that would be a surface parking lot directly mm -hmm. across the street that we would construct it in that location. So they would be located directly across the street. And if Board of Elections is on that floor, I know currently they have that, uh, act, they, they use the current location for voting and, and for people, handicapped people and so forth. How, how would they take care of that issue? Will they still have the Board of Elections that they have now? Or uh, how would that We, we have spoken with, uh, with Linda Grist and she, she feels comfortable that they can do it at that location. There are elevators that go all the way up. The building is, of course, the handicap accessible uh, and uh, and then they would also look at, at a, at a uh, satellite location to, to do the one-stop voting that. as well there was some discussion also about possibly having the one-stop voting in a lobby um, at floor level the ground level right. and there's a there, there are several options available down here between all the buildings the county uh, owns to do that. Uh, I know that um, some of us, at least I have been approached by uh, someone who had another piece of property for us to look at. Is it possible for us to just get a synopsis of that piece of property before the next meeting so that we have something to 
Yes, ma'am. No, uh, I, I have, I, in fact, I received. with another way or not? Sure. I, I received some packets today. I'll distribute to the, those to the board uh, prior to you leaving today so you'll have those to review as well. Um, I think it's important that if we move forward with this, that we, this board and future boards understand it's a temporary location. And when I mean temporary, temporary for a couple of years, not weeks or months. Um, because it was intended for, um, as the Sheriff's Department needs to expand years down the road, that they would expand into that area. I think that was the prior board's or prior board's decisions. Uh, number one. Number two is I would, I would want to make certain that um, all security be available because it is a Sheriff's Department and we don't need people roaming around that shouldn't be roaming around in different floors of the Sheriff's Department as possible. I know that can be accomplished by speaking to Sheriff Riley. Yeah, there, there's there's security checkpoints all over with, with um, card access, key access, okay. that type of thing that are required throughout the building. So there would, uh, while some of this would be open to the general public, the inner workings of the building would not be. Okay. And, and it's still, it's true that the, you, you, the public can take the elevator now and go to any of the floors that are there and there are public office interfaces but there are security areas that you have to have a card to, to get into and that of course would not change the other thing with the um, additional opportunities that we recently learned of um, are at least twice the cost of what we're looking at here and that'll probably be the case with anywhere I mean, this is an exception here because it's it's shelled space it's it's much less expensive to develop and I would certainly encourage um, YCH or whoever does the architecture to do secured space up up on that floor as well because whoever's in the sheriff's department doesn't need to be roaming around up in, yeah. in veterans administration or EMS or exactly. uh, you know so that I think that it needs to be both sides yes sir at one time we we may have mentioned uh, moving some folks out of the courthouse into onto that floor to make space at the courthouse to give them more space is that anything been done with that will there be that, some people that would be part of this project of as well okay. yeah we would we would go ahead and, and have the, the architects to go ahead and start programming the space based on their needs their our county departments and we can shuffle and move them around and there should be some space left over that we could at least start that process of moving some out of the courthouse into there to 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 provide some additional space for those remaining behind over there because the space is, is needed whatever space comes from the courthouse over to that floor i would caution that it not be probation um, only because probation to get to probation now you have to go through metal detectors right and over there if there's not going to be metal detectors i don't think probation needs to be have probationers need to have that sort of access to probation officers mm -hmm. as you know i think that so that i don't know what is going to be a down the plan but i certainly would right caution against having that thought right. process. We, we would meet the the needs of the county departments first and like I said if there was some okay. space remaining and then we would look at other entertain things. those okay yes, do we have a motion to place this under new business or do you want it under consent uh, with the new information that Commissioner Minot may be wanting to look at let's do it under new under business, new business yeah. we have a motion we have a motion we have a second all in favor say aye aye all opposed motion carries Next matter is G9, found on page 131, is the request to convert ownership and maintenance of the Far Mill Road Park to town of Harrisburg. Mr. Downs. Uh, the county received a, uh, a request from the town of Harrisburg, from their, their new town administrator, and they are requesting to uh, take over ownership and maintenance of the Far Mill Park. They are, it is it is currently in their established service area or their growth areas, and they intend to annex the, the uh, neighborhood or subdivision right right directly adjacent to it uh, as soon as as soon as they can as well. Uh, they're in the process of, of doing a uh, park master plan, and they want to uh, include this as a, this is a strategic location as far as the, what they see as their future. And how they would <coughs> they would uh, put their spread their park throughout their jurisdiction. Uh, so they came to us and they talked to uh, Miss Strong and myself last week. 
uh, and, and presented that to us. Um, we have since gone back, Ms. Strong has gone back, because this park was built with county money and uh, federal and state money through grants. Uh, there, there's some restrictions. The town would like to go ahead and take over ownership, and it may be that we're, we're not able to actually transfer the property to, property to them immediately just because of the grants that are in place. So it may be that we look at a long-term lease, uh, but uh, what we would suggest that if, if you, if the board uh, agrees, uh, then then we would move forward in the, I have to talk loud, I need to get my sign over there, okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if the board degree, uh, agrees that this would the be- The television uh, audience can't hear you. Yeah, I understand. Even though yeah. you do have a loud voice. I, I forgot <laughs> to push the button. <laughs> uh, so that's where we're at now, if, and uh, bring it to the board to see if that's something that they would would, uh, would entertain doing. As from the staff perspective, it would be that the town would take over the maintenance and therefore the, the county would no longer have the uh, annual expense. Uh, yeah, come on, come on up, come on up. You may have some questions. Uh, While Ms. Strong is coming up, I do want to let the board know that when I found out about the Harrisburg's request, um, I thought it was important that we talk to at least the chairman of the Parks Commission, which is uh, Mr. Guess spoke to him by telephone today saying that that we've been approached that this board does not want to circumvent the Parks Commission board but we would like to get their input he he along with Ms. Strong I believe sent out an email this afternoon to get the Parks Commission input as to what their thoughts are because they will not meet before our April the 19th meeting um, so that I wanted to make it abundantly clear to him as well as to Ms. Strong is that we're not circumventing anything. It was just offered in order for us to move forward during our budget. It would help us to know what we're going to do. Um, so that that's the reason why it's on today and possibly on the 19th. And Mr. Chairman, if I could also point out that there is a precedent for something very similar. The county uh, with grant funds developed WW Flow Park, uh, which is now operated by the city of Concord. And there is a, a lease agreement there. Uh, that property was bequeathed to the county, and so there were uh, restrictions on the transfer of the property. Um, but I think we could do something very similar uh, with the town of Harrisburg. Ms. Strong, do you have anything that you would like to add or that we may have missed? Um, I don't think so. I was going to <clears throat> bring that point up about WW Flow and the city of Concord operating it, but we do own it. Um, they have, uh, they're a growing department newly formed department and have staff and really want to program and we currently don't have the staff to be at that facility which we don't do programs anyway so to me it seems like it would be a win-win for everyone the facility would still be there there would be people operating it and the citizens would be the beneficiaries of it any other questions or <clears throat> why don't we place this under new business so we can actually get the the final language and then um, if there's any further questions, uh, unless you need to be there, Mr. Strong, Mr. Downs can present it on, on the 19th unless you prefer to be there or no, if the board is in, in opposition, certainly mm -hmm. let us know that, but, um, you know, we can go from there. And we have a motion to place this under new business. So move. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Next matter um, is supposed to be the 2010 legislative agenda. Actually, that, my intent had been to move this to May, so I'm right. sorry this one slipped by. It was supposed to be in next month. Um, any objections to place this in, in May for presentation? We have a motion to place this in on the May work session. So All in favor? Or second? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Um, one thing that, that I want to make certain if there's any questions or any further questions and uh, under old business E1 on page 10, the uh, research city LLC um, if there is any, I know that there was a case that was cited by Mr. Moretz at our last meeting um, and I didn't know, Mr. Cook, if you wanted to apprise the board of that, the Ammons case, I believe it was. 
think it was well, Ammons. It may not have the been. The Ammons case was the one that, that I cited okay. in my memo that, that I thought supported uh, the interpretation of, of that uh, statute concerning refunds. Uh, um, Mr. Moretz had uh, uh, cited a case that, as I recall, involved the city of Greensboro or Guilford County, and I, I did not bring that file with me this afternoon. Um, but I think I sent, did I send you a copy of that, Mr. You Chairman? Send it to me, and I'll okay. forward it along to all the other okay. commissioners. Um, in my reading of the case doesn't support the, the position that the taxpayer is taking in citing that case for authority uh, as authority for, uh, uh, for a refund in this situation. Um, but uh, I figured we'd be dealing with that. If he was still going to rely on that, presumably he would do so in the, uh, in the meeting on the 19th. Uh, the, if I could mention that there were a couple of questions that uh, the commissioners had concerning that. Uh, 2009 taxes have been paid. Uh, remember, this, this issue involves 2006 through 2008. Um, so we know those taxes have been paid. I, mean, I don't ha yet have a copy of the check to show <laughs> exactly who, th who, th who uh, the payor was, but uh, they, they were, in fact, paid. Um, the other issue concerned the interplay of that Chapter 13 bankruptcy that the, that the uh, occupants of the house and presumably the owners of it um, uh, and um, we pulled everything we could concerning that case off the PACER, which is the bankruptcy um, uh, national network. And it really couldn't fully address the questions that I think Commissioner Poole had. So I have uh, been communicating with uh, Warren Tadlock, who's the Chapter 13 trustee. And, hope and hopefully by the meeting, I'll have all the information concerning um, what the uh, what his office has done with respect to uh, the adjudication of, uh, of those issues. The Chapter 13 trustee actually administers a Chapter 13 plan and he collects the money from the, from the debtor and then pays it out according to the claims that have been made in, in the Chapter 13 plan. So uh, hopefully we'll have all that uh, by the 19th. Okay. Very good. Any other, any questions for Mr. Cook? I know there was some issues on that night that we needed to that were we need to be fleshed out, but um, if there are, just let them know. Uh, last thing that, that I wanted to call to the board's attention that's not on the agenda is that in the paper this weekend, there was a, an article about uh, a request by Kannapolis and Concord to um, have Google uh, as a, to speed up an internet process. And it, in reading the article, it did not seem as though it was going to be uh, in competition with um, others, you know, businesses. I didn't know if this board wanted to consider uh, a supporting resolution to support their efforts in providing it um, without knowing what your vote is or what your thoughts are. Um, I was going to get something together and send it out to everyone for y'all to consider um, for the 19th. I know this is last minute, but um, if we were to pass something, it would be just to support their efforts in trying to, to move forward with this project. Um, so, any other questions, any other comments, anything that we need to move, dis decide today or discuss today? Ms. Honeycutt, I believe this takes care of the agenda, is that correct? Uh, one thing I want oh, yes. to. Oh, yeah. We have two things. Two things, right. Um, um, census. Tell. Well, actually, I'm not sure what the hours are. The Census um, Bureau does have a worker in the rotunda of the county building that appears to be there most of the time, but I'm not sure exactly what the hours are. It's usually 9 to 1. Okay. And it's every day of the week, is that correct, Mrs. Honeycutt? Um, or every other, at least a couple I days I thought I saw a banner this morning saying Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or it may have been Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. I think uh, that's correct, and when they're not here, they are leaving a lot of their literature down there on a table for the public to either come back or sort of a frequently asked questions type thing. I thought it was important that, that if, you're in, if you're having trouble filling out the census, there's some help that will be available for anybody that would need, need some help. And the second? The second is the county has been selected to receive the North Carolina State University Local Government Engagement Partnership Award, which will be presented um, just a little bit before the board has its meeting on the 19th, and the presentation is in Raleigh. Uh, at the McKemmon Center. So I don't know if uh, any board member wants to um, skip the board meeting and receive that on behalf of the county or 
Um, we can also send a staff member to accept on the behalf of the county. Um, in particular, I don't know if Commissioner Carruth might be tied up in Raleigh again. If so, then he'd certainly be a very good person to be able to do that. But I just wanted to let you give anybody the opportunity uh, if they should like to try and, and accept that award on behalf of the county. It's not given every year. It's only given uh, when the university feels some uh, community has um, done something worth recognizing with regard to partnering with the university. In our case, it's what we've been doing with uh, Cooperative Extension and the university uh, related to local food. I think if, if one of us cannot attend, um, then if, if Mrs. Boss was available to attend, uh, I think that would be appropriate. Um, or somebody from her agency that she would recommend to attend. I think that would be something uh, would be a good representation from the county. So, um, and if you can get in touch with Mr. Commissioner Cruz to see what his availability is, if you know he's choice number one, I think uh, from this board, and then from there. Okay. Anything further? Do we have a motion to adjourn until April the nineteenth? So move, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed. We're closed.